The following message is a production of Tony Broom Ministries. This session today is entitled, God, Faithful Husband and Father. He is a loving Heavenly Father. He's a faithful Heavenly Father. No matter what you go through, no matter what you face, God is there to help us, and He's there to bless us. This Old Testament book of Hosea is somewhat of a different story. It's a passionate story. It's a story of triumph. It's a story of tragedy. It's a story that, well, we could say this is real life. This is not way up in the clouds. It's not Ezekiel's glory. It's not Isaiah's holy, holy, holy. But it's real life where we live. And Hosea talks to us about God's love for the children of Israel and for the world, really. But he speaks to the nation to try to get them to look to God, to turn around and give God the right place in their heart that they need to. We have verses from chapters 1, 2, 3, and 11. Our central truth is short. It just says God can be trusted completely. We can trust Him completely. Really, if we don't trust Him completely, we're really not trusting Him, are we? Not like we should. It is almost like saying, well, I believe, but I partly believe. No, you don't partly believe. You either believe or you don't believe. I know we're like the man in Mark chapter 9 that says, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. There's nothing wrong with asking God to help us with our unbelief. We still believe even though we may have doubts at times. But you cannot believe in doubt at the same time. You either believe or you doubt. And when you believe, sometimes doubt tries to come in and hinder that belief. But you have to push that doubt aside and say, I believe in God no matter what. Our Bible focus, I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. Hosea chapter 2, verse 19. Betrothed is a wonderful, loving word. It speaks of an agreement that's made between two parties to be married. It may not happen right away, but it's going to happen sometimes. Sounds kind of like the agreement between Christ and His church. We're the bride of Christ, and we're married to the Lord. The marriage hadn't really taken place all the way yet, but He's redeemed us and He's bought us by His blood. He's forgiven our sins. He's written our names in the Lamb's book of life. Praise God. And we have the opportunity to be able to be redeemed, to be born again, to be washed in His blood. He is our Redeemer. He is our Goed. He is our kinsman Redeemer. He is the one who is our Father. He's our Husband. He's our Lord. If you're lonely today, maybe your husband is gone to be with the Lord. Maybe your wife is gone to be with the Lord. But Jesus is your husband. Jesus is like your wife, not a physical wife, but He is your companion. Jesus is with you. And we're part of the bride of Christ. We're just waiting on Him to come and get us and to take us to that royal palace in the sky to be with Him. And in the meantime, we ought to be doing everything we can to get ourselves ready. When a bride, she gets so happy about being married to her husband, she poofs up her hair and she gets her face ready and she puts on her earrings and jewels. And that's the way we ought to be about the coming of the Lord. We ought to be excited that Jesus is coming. People talking about the flu season. No, it's not the flu season. It's the Jesus season. It's all according to how you think and how the Word is in your life. Oh, it's time for bad colds. No, it's not time for bad colds. It's time for good blessings. Time of the Holy Spirit. Time for the anointing of the blessing of God. It's all according to how you direct your life and allow the Spirit to direct your life. Oh, things are looking bad. No, things are not looking bad. Things are good. Yeah, things around us, of course, they look bad sometimes. But we're not governed by the circumstances around us. We live according to the principles of the kingdom of God. And the Lord is our husband. The Lord is our redeemer. He's coming back to get us and take us to that home in the sky, to that mansion in the sky. 
There was this country song that talked about take me to the mansion in the sky. Well, they don't know nothing about the mansion in the sky I'm going to. Ain't no country song got to take me to a mansion in the sky. Jesus said in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come and get you and take you to be with me. That where I am, there you may be also. Hallelujah. This first part talks about a woman named Gomar. And it's entitled, A Wife's Adultery. Hosea was told a strange thing to do. A real strange thing. He was told to get a woman as a wife that had been a prostitute. It was actually a prostitute. You say, what in the world is that all about? Well, God was going to use this situation to show a picture, portrait, of what the children of Israel were doing. They were turning away from God. They were going against the things of God. And so here we go in Hosea chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came to unto Hosea. Hosea. His name means deliverance or salvation. So this man's name means deliverance or salvation. He's the son of Biri. But Eri means man of a well or my well. You've heard of Beersheba. By Ereshiba. It means a well of seven. The seventh well. By air, a beer as it is in English, is a well. My well. So you have my well. The son of my well comes salvation. From the son of the well comes salvation. God don't give you no little cup. He gives you a well of salvation. In the Old Testament, of course, David said, I'll take the cup of salvation and I'll call on the name of the Lord. And that's wonderful. But when Jesus comes... He trades that cup in and gives you a well. He tells a woman at the well, you'll draw waters out of this well. Salvation will be in you a living well of fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. This word came to Hosea in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel. So when a prophet is introduced by being in the days of so-and-so, the kings of Judah. Then he's speaking to the nation of Judah. If he's introduced by being in the days of so-and-so, the king of Israel, he's speaking primarily to Israel. But when you have a prophet like Hosea, who is introduced being in the days of the kings of Judah and Israel, you know that he's speaking to both kingdoms. He's speaking to the northern kingdom of Israel, the Ephraim, and he's speaking to the southern kingdom of Judah. So we can just say he's speaking to all of them. He's talking to everybody. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms. For the children of Israel, the land has committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer. Gomer means complete the daughter of Diblium, and his name means cluster of figs. This Gomer, her name means complete, but she spent her life trying to find completeness, trying to find satisfaction. She went from one lover to another and couldn't be satisfied, and she came to Hosea, and it's almost like she's saying, I'll try to religious way for a little while. Well, that didn't satisfy her either because her heart wasn't in it. She kept going back and forth and she just couldn't find no satisfaction, as the psalm said. And that, of course, is her name. Gomer, she conceived and bare him a son. And the Lord said unto him, call his name Jezreel. Jezreel means God scatters. For yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. In other words, they're going into captivity because they've sinned against God. Verses 6 through 10, And she conceived again and bare a daughter. And God said unto him, Call her name Loruhamah. Loruhamah means no favored, not favored. For I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel. That is a sad statement. God is saying, you've sinned against me. You've gone against me so much that I can't even show you my mercy anymore. 
but I will utterly take them away. And he's talking about their captivity of the northern kingdom again. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah and will save them by the Lord their God and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. And if you read the story, God saved them by an angel of the Lord who went forth with such power that he destroyed the enemy of thousands and thousands. At one time, it was 185,000 that were destroyed at one time. Don't you tell me my God don't have no power. God can do anything. And so that's what he did. Now when she had weaned lo Ruhamah, she conceived and bare a son. Then said God, call his name lo Ami. lo Ami means not my people. For ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. There again, because they had sinned against God, he says, you're not my people. It's not that God had moved anywhere. We've sinned against God. In America, we've moved against God. We've moved away from God. God hadn't gone anywhere. We've turned away from God. We don't want Him in the schoolhouse anymore. We don't want Him in the courthouse anymore. We don't even want Him in many churches anymore. So we moved against God. We moved away from God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. How in the world can he do that? Because God still is going to have mercy. He still will save the red and yellow, black and white, Jew and Gentile. God will see to it that people are saved. And if Israel will not hear the voice of God, and they didn't, nationally speaking, he will find someone who will listen to the gospel. And thank God that's given us as Gentile dogs, if you will, an opportunity to get in and to hear God's plan of salvation and be saved. I hate that Israel rejected their Messiah. I hate that they turned away from their God. But I'm glad that in that they did turn away from their God, that they gave me an opportunity to get in on God's plan of salvation. Thank God that He included me. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, 5, 7, and 8. Say ye unto your brethren, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruhamah. Say to your brothers, My people, and to your sisters, favored. God still wants to have favor on us. If He would judge us by our sin, we would all be in hell today, but He still wants us to be His people. Instead of saying, Lo Ruhamah, He says, Ruhamah. Just taking Lo out. Lo means no or not in Hebrew. And instead of saying, Lo Ami, he says, Ami, I want you to be my people. Take that no, take that not out of there. Take that negative out of there. I want you to be my people. Plead with your mother. Plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. For their mother hath played the harlot. She that conceived them hath done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water, my oil, my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better with me than now. Their mother, these children, were called upon to plead with their mother. It seems like we ought to be pleading with our children and our grandchildren, but so many times they end up having to plead with us. Instead of us saying, kids, get right with God, a lot of times a kid has to say, Grandma, Grandpa, Mom and Dad, get right with God. Take me to church. Let's learn about Jesus. And these children are pleading with their mother to come back home. Mama, we need you. The old life was calling. Maybelline doesn't start her back doing the things she used to do. Of course, her name wasn't Maybelline. It was Gomer. And Gomer wasn't Paul, but Gomer was in a whole pile of trouble. 
She was having a bad time. The old life kept calling her back. And she didn't have the strength to be able to stand against it. She went back. She kept going back and falling back into her old ways. And they pleaded with her to come back. And it shows the love of God. That God continues to plead with men and women, boys and girls, come to me. Come unto me, all ye who are labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. You'll find rest to your souls. My burden is easy. My yoke is light. I'm not going to make it heavy on you. The world, the devil, the flesh, the evil things of the world, that makes it heavy on you. You come to me, I'm not going to make it heavy on you. I'll make it light for you. And God calls us, and He continues to deal with us. She did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. They didn't realize she thought it was coming from these lovers in the world and that they gave me gold and silver. And when you get in the world and you live for the devil and the flesh and the pride of life, you start thinking about, I made this money and I did this and I did that. And all the success and the fame that you have gotten and you don't realize that the very breath in your soul comes from God Almighty. And He gives you your house and your car and your food and your children and your grandchildren and everything that we have comes from God. And now the second part, a husband's love. Chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. That means I will charm her. God is not through loving on His woman, as it were, yet. God is not through loving Israel. God is not through. If you think God is through loving Israel, you've got to know it's all coming. God still has a plan and purpose for Israel. God gave them that land forever, and they'll go back there again. they got some tribulation to face, as well as a whole lot of the rest of the world. We don't get right with God. We've got that awful tribulation coming. But God says, I'll allure her. I'll charm her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor. Achor means trouble. The valley of Achor for a door of hope. They took Achan, which means trouble also, and they took him down there to that valley of Achor and they stoned him to death. And that's a bad thing that he did by taking things that wasn't supposed to be taken and Joshua told the children of Israel not to do it and Jericho was destroyed and he saw that, coveted those things and took them and covered it up and then God found him out because God knows all about it and God exposed it. They ended up stoning him there in that place but when life looks like an ahor, when life looks like a valley of trouble, God said, I'll turn that thing around and make it a door of hope. Kurabasalamadai. Praise God. When things look so bad and things look so hopeless, disease comes and sickness and financial things. It looks like there's no way out. God said, I can take that acor. I can take that valley and I can turn it into a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. God said, I'll cause the girl to sing again. It looks to Israel who will rejoice again just like she did when she came out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi in English. In Hebrew is Ishi. means my husband, my man. Actually means my man. And it's used to mean my husband. You'll call me my husband, Ishi, and shall call me no more Bali, which means my idol, Baal, or Lord over me. They would use sometimes Baal for Baal, Bali, Lord over me like a servant. Instead of saying, you're just a servant over me, I'm in trouble, I reckon you can just whip me in. Stone me or whatever you want to do. God says, instead of saying that, you're going to say, you're my husband. I'm going to bring you back into a loving relationship with me. For I will take away the names of Balaam. And Balaam is the plural of Baal. The names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. 
God wants to take away the mess of the world out of our life as believers. Sometimes we still get stuck to these things in the world, the culture and the names and the job of the world. If you're not careful as a preacher, you'll start talking more job than you do holiness. And it's not necessarily bad or cursing or anything like that, but you get to be connected too much with the world and you have to be separated from the world. Don't allow those idol names and those names of Hollywood stars to mean more to you and to be more in your mind and your heart than the name of Jesus Christ. We think as much about Jesus as we do about the current events and the politics and the idols and the sports figures and da 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 all the bound you could go. We think about Jesus more because He's the only one who is everlasting. All this other stuff is going to be done away with. Verses 19 and 20, I will betroth, I will engage you unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment. God will judge if He has to. He's a righteous God. And in loving kindness, God wants to love us. He's such a kind and wonderful loving Savior. Makes you want to praise Him in spite of yourself. And in mercies, God is a merciful God. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. We can know Him. He's our Redeemer. He's our wonderful Savior. Chapter 3, verse 1, Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, do it again. She done went away again. Love a woman, beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. They'd rather drink wine than to be filled up on the Holy Ghost. And that's why the New Testament says, don't be drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Can't get too much of that. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And so God is saying here, go get her back. She's gone into sin. This time she had gone so low that she was a servant of one of her lovers. So, he says, I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for an homer of barley and an half homer of barley. This was the price that was paid for a slave. Hosea says, I went and I went on the slave block and I had to buy her back to me for the price of a slave. So now not only is Gomer his wife, but she's also... And I hate to say it, but it is what the Bible says. She says property. She had gone so low that he had to buy her back. You say, that's terrible. Yeah, but didn't God buy us? Didn't He create us? Didn't He buy us? Didn't He shed the price of His own blood and give His body for our sins? You see, we are not our own anymore. We can't just do what we want to do. Or we can, but we shouldn't because we're bought with a price. And you know Him. And it says here, And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days, thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man, so will I also be for thee. Now he has a right, not only as her husband now, but he has a right to tell her what to do. Now you are going to stay at home, not just because you're my husband and you ought to. You're going to stay at home and do what's right because I've had to go by you. I paid a price for you. And you're going to stay here and you're going to do what's right. And of course now she has no other choice. She's so low. She got like us. Got in the gutter and shame of sin so low that you had nowhere else to go. When you get in sin so low and your life is in shambles, you look up to God and He comes along and He has a price for your redemption and He shed His blood for you dying on the old rugged cross rising in power and glory for your justification. And He sits at the Father's right hand now making intercession for you in heaven. Don't you think you want to serve and praise somebody like that? And praise His wonderful name. Now, the third part, a father's love. This is seeing God's love as never before. In 11 chapter verse 1, When Israel, and Israel means who prevails with God, was a child, then I loved him. I was able to love him. God always loves him. But I was able to show them my love and call my son out of Egypt. Egypt means that troubles or oppressors. 
That's why when Israel was in Egypt, God said to Pharaoh, let my people go. Because as long as they're down there in that place that troubles and oppresses, they cannot serve God like they should. I want to free them from that which troubles and oppresses. I want to free them from Egyptian bondage and I want to bring them out where they can serve me like I want them to. I call my son out of Egypt. There's another fulfillment of that prophecy. You know, when Jesus was born, Herod tried to do him in. The angel of the Lord speaks to Joseph, take the young child and his mother, flee into Egypt by night. So he did. And he stayed there until those that were dead who sought the child's life. And then when God spoke to Joseph and said, they're dead, you can come back. And so he comes back out of Egypt and it fulfills the scripture here where it says, out of Egypt have I called my son. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam and burned incense to graven images. And it's Israel's activity again. I taught Ephraim to go. Ephraim means fruitful and increasing, and they ended up being everything but that. Taking them by their arms. They were like a little baby. And I took them by their arms and showed them how to walk like you do your kids and like you do your grandchildren. But they knew not that I healed them. I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love. I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaws. I was their burden lifter. I was their yoke destroying anointing. And I laid meat unto them. I was the one who took care of them and gave them everything that they needed. And God still does that for all of us. Verse 9 says, I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. And I say glory to God for that. Thank you, God, for not pouring out your wrath on us like you certainly could. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man. Thank God that he's God and we're not. If we were God, we'd have thumped them off a long time ago because they act too much like us. That's why we get so angry at them. But God is God. And he says, I'm God and not man. The Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. Oh, I wish God would come. I wish the Lord would come. And the Lord said, you might not want me to do that. You better get right with me before I come into Henderson. You better get right with me before I come to America. You might not really want me to come down there. Sometimes we ask Him to come, and we don't really know what we're saying. Of course, we as believers, we want Him to come. We're ready for Him to come again. God, who is a faithful God. And he uses this Old Testament book. It has 14 chapters. Some of them are short. But God uses the book of Hosea to speak to us. God, who is a faithful husband and father. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you because you love us. You have an everlasting and undying and unending love. You have shown us your love and commended your love to us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I thank you, Lord, that you had a plan of salvation and mercy for us and made many souls come to Christ and be born again and know what it is to know this wonderful, loving husband and heavenly father that you are. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The preceding message has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries. 